In the previous videos we talked about why we might want to use templates, what happens under the hood when we use them, and how to use function templates. Today, finally, we can talk about how to use class templates. On the surface, they're kind of similar to function templates, but, well, for classes. With one crucial difference that enables most of C++ metaprogramming. That difference is that we can partially specialize class templates. And I can't stress enough how important that is. Before we start talking about actual class templates, I want to briefly talk about class method templates. We can write them just like any freestanding function template, and we can treat static class method templates in the same way. All of these class method templates can appear in any class or struct, and it doesn't matter if that class or struct is a class template itself or not. Such template methods behave in exactly the same way as the normal function templates, so we should already know how to use them after the previous lectures. And just like with function templates, we can overload or specialize these methods. And just like with function templates, we still should prefer overloading these methods. As a tiny exercise, tell me in the comments which methods get called in which order in this example. There is one difference to the freestanding functions, though. While it is always possible to introduce a new overload for a freestanding function at any place in the codebase after that function was defined, it is impossible to create a new class method overloads outside of class declaration. So if we cannot change the code of our class, we're left with full class function template specialization as our only option. And just like before, please tell me in the comments what do you think gets called now. We can add these specializations anywhere in the codebase. After the class declaration, that is. Anyway, with all of this out of the way, we are ready to talk about class templates. The good news is that uh, if we know how to use function templates and what classes are, the syntax for class templates will look very logical and familiar. Another good news is that we've seen class templates before. A lot of STL containers like studvector, studarray, or studmap are actually class templates, and that's why we can put values of nearly any but same type into them. So, for the sake of example, let's say I want to write a simple class that will represent a coordinate of a pixel on a screen that has int row and column and does not much more than just pack them together as well as allow getting or printing their values. This is all good, but I come from robotics and image processing background where we regularly need the so-called subpixel resolution, meaning that our coordinates should be represented by a floating point number. So, we suddenly also need a float coordinate class. And that is not nice, is it? And of course, you've already guessed that we can use class templates to get around this in an elegant way. We can replace our coordinate and float coordinate with a single class template coordinate. A lot of things here are just like what we saw before for function templates. We declare the class template by prefixing our class with the word template. We provide any number of template parameters. Here just one scalar t, prefixing it with the keyword type name or class. And the compiler still doesn't care which names we give them, but I would still advise to give this template parameters readable names. We can use our template parameter scalar t anywhere in our class, just like we would use any other type. When we instantiate an object of our class, we provide the type that we want to use, which triggers implicit template instantiation. Stay tuned for explicit template instantiation, too. This means that the compiler creates a specialization of our class template for the concrete type that we're using it with. Uh, we can see this in detail using the awesome website cppinside.io, where we see that in our example the compiler generates two concrete classes, one for int and one for float coordinates. For more, see lecture on what templates do under the hood. If our class has a constructor that uses all of our template types, and we are using at least C17, we can make use of class template argument deduction, or CTAD and omit the template arguments when creating our objects. This process uses implicit and explicit type deduction guides, which is a bit of a niche topic and I don't plan to actively cover it in this course, but if we have a constructor for our class, we don't have to worry about it and the compiler will mostly be able to figure out the underlying types that we meant. I use it all the time, but this is a bit of a controversial topic. If you look into the Google code style for C++, at least uh, as of the date of preparing this lecture, they suggest to steer away from using CTAD, because the compiler might fail to deduce the type we expect it to deduce. We can provide explicit type deduction guides, but we won't cover it here. I believe that once you really 
need to use it, you'll know enough of C++ to read about it on your own. You can always read more in cppreference.com under user-defined deduction guides. From the lecture on what templates do under the hood, we already know that the code that actually gets compiled is just a copy of the code in our template with the chosen type substituted instead of the template parameters. These copies are called specializations, and we touched upon this before too. So when we use a class template to instantiate an object in our code, the compiler creates such a specialization, then uses that to create an object. But we don't have to wait for the compiler to create such a specialization at the first call site. We can, and sometimes want, to create one explicitly on our own. This is called explicit template specialization, and it can be full and partial. We already talked about full template specialization when we talked about function templates, because that's the only option we have with function templates, even though we should overload functions instead of specializing them. Well, turns out that uh, we can use the same full template specializations with classes too, and in that case it actually does have a valid use case. In order to fully specialize a class template, we have to basically fully re-implement a class for a concrete type, prefixing it with template opening and closing bracket. Now, uh, when we create a variable of this matching template instantiation, no implicit template instantiation is created by the compiler, and it reuses the explicit template instantiation that we provide manually. I encourage you to play around with this simple example, printing things from these classes' template specializations to get a better intuition about what is happening. Notice how this is very similar to what we saw in the cppinsights.io before. The only difference is that now we force one of the specializations to be created explicitly. Note that as we implemented the other explicit specialization, it is our responsibility to implement the full class, along with all the data and methods that it provides. If we implement it differently from the original class template, it will behave differently when we try to use our specialization, which might be confusing or error-prone. Imagine if we, for whatever reason, dropped the print function in our specialization. This example won't compile, as there is no print function found in the class template specialization for float. So, uh, if we do decide to specialize a class, we have to make sure it conforms to the same logical interface as the original template. Otherwise, uh, we're probably going to go through a whole lot of pain. Okay, story time. One famous example of such a template specialization that does not fully conform to the interface that the original base template has is the specialization of the std vector for bool type. If you remember when we talked about std vector in one of the previous lectures, I cautioned not to use std vector bool. So here is a story behind that suggestion. By default, if we store a bool, it will still take a full byte of memory even though we logically need just one bit to represent the stored value, true or false. So naively, if we store a number of bool variables in some array, we will lose some memory. We will use about eight times the memory we could have. At some point, the standardization committee decided that it would be a nice idea to have a specialization for the std vector class template uh, for type bool that addresses this issue. This specialization would allow to pack the boolean values together, eight per byte, and as such, save space. It made sense too, a vector was designed to store a bunch of values in sequence, so it was conceivable that anybody who will want to store bool variables will want to pack them tightly. The issue is that because we tightly pack these boolean values, we can't really access them by a normal reference as we do with any other type. Type bool on its own still takes usually one byte, and so std vector bool returns a bit reference temporary wrapper instead that handles all the bit fiddling which means that innocent-looking code like this will not compile. In addition to that, returning a temporary wrapper might actually be quite a bit slower, so there is a trade-off between storage and speed, and forcing people to pack booleans together forces their hand. As you might imagine, not everybody was a fan of this idea. Anyway, long story short, while it is cool that std vector is so flexible and interesting that we can reduce the usage of space occupied by a vector of booleans by a factor of 8, it has been widely considered a wrong move. And generally people are suggested to avoid using std vector bool and use different class specifically designed for this purpose if they need an array of bits. I encourage you to read more about this from people who know much more about any of this. Howard Hinnant and Herb Sutter. The links are below the video, of course. You might start noticing that sometimes it might be useful to specialize just one method of a class 
And there is a way to do it, um, as we can specialize a single method of a class template too. For the sake of example, let us specialize the print function for the specialization of our class template for type float. We just need to add a definition of a single function for our class specialization following the pattern that we should be used to by now, adding the template with empty brackets prefix. The main difference is that uh, as we are implementing a class method, we have to indicate this by prefixing the name of the function with coordinate float four dots. Note that we did not need to implement other methods of the generic coordinate class. This makes such a pattern quite useful. If a class still needs to conform to some generic interface, we usually don't need to specialize all of its methods, just some. And uh, we can also do this long after we're done designing our original class template. Now, if we would want to specialize a class method template that itself is found within a class template, we could still specialize it with just stacking multiple template empty brackets prefixes together. So if we would want a method cast2 that casts our coordinate row and column to a different type, we would be able to fully specialize such a method by specializing the class coordinate int four dots with the first template empty brackets and then method cast to int itself with the second template empty brackets. Running this shows that we are able to convert from a float coordinate to int coordinate and can perform a trivial cast after that. Going back to a class template specialization, there is one canonical example where full class template specialization is widely used. I am talking about the implementation of the so-called type traits. If you're not familiar with these, they're usually tiny structs that are designed to tell us certain things about various types. There is a bunch of these defined in the standard, like for example the std is integral, that checks if the provided type is integer in an abstract sense. We can see how it works by using a static assert that checks that any given boolean condition is true at compile time. So if we combine all of the std is integral values for various input types, we should get true in the end, which we can check by compiling this code. The way such a type trait can be implemented uses nothing but class template specialization and it's genius in its simplicity. We start by defining the base trait that has a static value constant set to false for any given type. Now we can access the value for any of our class template instantiations as follows. And if we compile this assertion, it will not compile with an error that a static assertion has failed. And that's because we expect is integral int value to be true. And in our case, the value is false, regardless of the type we pass into our trade. And you might have already guessed that we can use class template specialization for this. Let us specialize our is integral class template by prefixing it with template empty bracket statements and uh, specifying int as the type for which we specialize it. Now, if we compile our search, they will compile without issues. And of course, we can repeat the same process for any other type that we consider to be integer-like, mostly variations on bool and char. And if you now think that it is a bit cumbersome to copy so much code to create an explicit specialization for any type we want, you're totally right, it feels a bit limiting. In the case of is integral, there is not too much we could do, but in most other cases, we can definitely do better. To illustrate this, let's implement our own type trait, is coordinate, that we can use for the sake of example to show better errors to the user should they try to use our library in the wrong way. We have a function template is valid that is able to validate a single coordinate, and we pass a vector of these coordinates to some other function template validate coordinates. If we pass a wrong type into this function, like std vector int instead of a vector of actual coordinates, we will get an error which is not very nice to read. Now, what we could do instead is check at compile time if we use the function correctly by, for the sake of example, putting a static assert into it. Now, if we try to write the same code, it won't compile with a much more readable error generated by our static assert. This is a powerful technique, but it is now slowly getting outdated as in C++20, we have an even better tool to do the same things, concepts, which we'll briefly talk about soon. As a short introduction, they will allow us to write code that looks something like this instead. Note the change from the type name keyword to a concept coordinate-like, which defines a set of rules that a type must conform to in order to be accepted for this template. This function, if we pass the wrong type into it, will generate a similarly nice error message. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. For now, we're interested in implementing such an isCoordinate trait and see any limitations uh, we encounter along the way. We start with the primary template that has a false static value constant and some of its explicit specializations for some of our coordinate types. We might notice that some things are not too optimal just yet. 
We are copying our ES coordinate trait for each of the coordinate template specializations, just like we did in our is integral trait implementation. And sure enough, if we want to cover any type that the coordinate template will accept, we're in for a lot of copying. Well, this is exactly what partial template specialization helps us avoid. Partial template specialization is a very powerful technique. Let's see how it makes our is coordinate trait much nicer. It looks like we need to pause here and unpack this syntax a bit. We still have the same primary template trait that sets value to be false using value initialization, and we still have the same static assert below. What changed is the way we define our template specialization. We replaced the template empty brackets that we would have used for full template specialization with another template type name T. This syntax, in my experience, can be slightly confusing for beginners for two reasons. It is relatively easy to confuse a new class template definition and a partial template specialization. The main indicator for the specialization is the coordinate t part that follows the class template name is coordinate. Another confusing part is that it might take some time to learn the differences between partial and full class template specializations. So here is a simple rule of thumb. Full specialization specializes a template with a concrete type and uses template empty brackets prefix. Partial specialization specializes a template with another template type, so needs template parameters in its definition. In our case, we have a template type parameter t, it appears in the coordinate t, which is a specialization of the coordinate template. We then specialize the is coordinate with the coordinate t type, making is coordinate coordinate t, a partial template specialization. We use the word partial because we don't fully constrain our specialization and the new input type t adds a degree of freedom to it. Now what the compiler does is it sees the call to is coordinate, coordinate int, and looks for an appropriate implementation. It finds the primary template is coordinate and then looks for any explicit specializations available. Out of those, it picks the most specialized one, which in our case is our only specialization. Here, a specialization is more specialized uh, than the other if uh, it only takes a subset of types that the other specialization takes. To fully understand the interplay of the full and partial class template specialization, let's have a look at this small artificial example where we have a custom dummy container for some data and some trait uh, that has a couple of specializations. Please spend some time playing with this example. By now you should be able to understand what each definition does, so do pause the video, think about it and type what will be printed to the terminal and uh, why in the comments. Also, while you're at it, hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. Partial template specialization works in exactly the same way if uh, there are more types. Like, uh, if we have a class foo that accepts three template parameters, we can write its partial specialization that takes, for example, just two types and reuses them to specialize the primary template. The compiler then still picks the most specialized out of all the template specializations it finds for a given class or struct when they're used. Play around with this a bit on tiny examples and see if everything that happens makes sense. If it doesn't, even after you slept on it, please do not hesitate to ask questions. This is an important topic to understand. That being said, because of the sheer power that templates and their specializations provide, um, there will be situations when what the compiler does will seem confusing. But if we firmly understand the concepts behind what is happening, uh, we should be able to eventually figure out what's going on. All in all, using templates with classes is one of the superpowers of C++. In combination with full and partial template specialization and function overloading, this enables most of the things that C++ is so well known for. Extreme flexibility that we only pay for with compile time. Well, at least almost. Class templates also enable most of what we know as template metaprogramming. That means writing code with complex logic that makes its results available at compile time. Furthermore, it was a stepping stone and the basis for arguably the most modern way to write C++ code by using concepts. So understanding how to use templates as well as various template specialization techniques is key to a happy life in C++. But don't worry if some concepts don't click from the first time. Play around with the examples, try to use templates in real code and see what causes you trouble. Then ask questions and I hope that in no time you will feel very comfortable using templates. And if you'd like to start watching all of the template related videos in the order that I intended them to be watched in, please feel free to watch this video, where I start with why we might be interested in using templates in the first place 
And if you'd rather dive deeper and refresh what templates do under the hood, then click on this video instead. Other than that, thanks again for watching, tell your friends if you want to further support my efforts at recording these videos, and see you next time. Bye.